good evening. I'm Adam Schiffer, Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science. I've been at TCU for seven years and I specialize in uh, American politics with a particular emphasis in the role of the news media. You may be a bit confused by the title, so let me clarify. A single action by 12 Texas Senate Republicans in the 2007 legislative session enabled Barack Obama to win the presidency. Did I say clarify? I meant confuse you further. We will solve the puzzle at the end of the talk, but first, let's do some political science. In a democracy, we like to believe that majority preferences, say whether Congress wants a bill to pass or not, will translate directly into outcomes the bill passes. However, one of the most important theoretical insights in poli-sci is that far more often than we'd like to believe, the structure trumps preferences in deciding outcomes. Now, what do I mean by structure? Well, let me give you an easy example that we all know. In the 2000 presidential election, Al Gore received approximately a half a million more votes than George W. Bush. But, of course, U.S. elections are not decided by the popular vote. Instead, the rules of the game empower an institution to decide the outcome. In this case, the Constitution, Article 2, empowered the Electoral College to decide the outcome which usually matches the popular vote total, except when it doesn't. <laughs> that's, that's obvious. Now, let's talk about primaries and caucuses, or the way that parties choose their presidential nominees. In this case, the rules of the game, for now we'll call it our wacky primary system, empower the news media. That's right. If I were to say that, that the press choose our nominees for us, that would be an exaggeration, but only slightly. The press wields tremendous power over the primary process. Why? Well, first, the uh, citizen's task in a primary is much more difficult than in a general election. In a general, a vast majority of party identifiers vote for their guy, as you can see happened in 2008. And this is actually a pretty good way to vote. If you identify very strongly with one party's priorities over the other, then you'll almost always be right about which candidate will better serve your interests just by knowing their party. But we don't have that shortcut in primaries. And it gets worse. In a general election, there are usually only two viable candidates, and they, they tend to hold opposite viewpoints on most of the hot issues that year. In a primary, however, there could be eight or as many as, as 10 candidates, and they'll often hold very similar viewpoints on the most important issues in that cycle. So the point is, choosing your party's nominee is actually a very difficult task. And as such, most citizens are entirely dependent on the media for information. And yet, the media only gives serious coverage to perhaps three or four candidates. So long before most people are even paying attention, the press has eliminated most of the field. Now once the press has narrowed the field, they, they play a, um, a profound role in uh, the shaping the candidates' fates by imposing narratives on each outcome. Now in a general election, the outcome is so clear and obvious that the press has no choice but to cover it accurately. But can you imagine a major news organization trying to get away with something like this? No, of course not. On the other hand, our wacky primary system consists of a series of primaries and caucuses, starting with uh, two small, mostly rural, almost all-white states, peaking a month later with half the nation voting on Super Tuesday, and then the other half of the states staggered across the next four months. Ultimately, it's a race for delegates and each state has its own complicated mechanisms for translating the primary and caucus outcomes into delegates. Now, it's this complexity and ambiguity that gives the press its power to shape the narratives in whatever fashion they please. Now, you might say, oh, hold on a second, whatever fashion they please? No, that, that doesn't sound right. I mean, the, uh, Obama and Huckabee won Iowa, Clinton and McCain won New Hampshire. I, I remember the press covering it exactly as such, so what's the problem? 
Here's where I urge you to step back and take a critical look at the way the primaries are covered and whether there were other equally plausible ways they could have been covered that would have had very different implications. So let's look at the coverage. Starting with uh, Iowa, we can see Obama and Huckabee uh, triumphed. They um, jumped to the front. They're already leaders of the pack. Wow, Obama's commanding win makes him the front runner. <laughs> wow, shazam. <laughs> no, really, shazam, <laughs> bam. OK, what about um, New Hampshire? That was next up. Uh, it was Clinton and McCain's night. And let's say a, a theme quickly emerged to the coverage. See if you can find it. Hmm. Yeah, see a pattern? In fairness, uh, some of the editors did pull out their thesaurus and, and instead called it rebound. <laughs> How about a uh, stunning comeback? Ah! So, <laughs> you can see what happens. The, the media, the, the, the narratives emerge election night on the, uh, the cable news channels, and by morning, everybody's reading off the same script. But let's take a critical look at these narratives. Is this really the best way to cover those first two races? Well, in order to find out, let's look at what really happened in those races. We'll start with what I can only describe as uh, Iowa's super wacky caucus system. For starters, who won the popular vote? Well, due to the complexity of the process, they're actually not able to count it. I'm not kidding. Instead, they tabulate the overall winners of each of the several thousand caucuses and add them all up and get the results. You can see Obama did win, but it was, it was hardly a blowout. So how many delegates did they each win, since that's what really matters? Actually, there's no way to know that either until the state conventions, uh, just, like, just like in Texas. But the media estimates on election night were as follows. Notice they don't track very well with the caucus outcomes. Again, it's a super wacky system. Now, let's focus on Obama versus Clinton. Obama's resounding victory was by one delegate. Now check this out. In order to win the nomination, a candidate, a de Democrat, needs 2,118 delegates. So in other words, Iowa provided Obama with less than 1% of what he needed. Percentage-wise, it's fairly similar to the first game of a 162-game baseball season. Now, could you imagine logging onto the Star Telegram website, uh, seeing that the Rangers had dropped a close game on opening day, and then reading, "Season ruined, no hope for a World Series." <laughs> of course not. The writer would be laughed out of the newsroom. And yet, for some reason, we let political journalists get away with equally dubious narratives. Now, what about the supposed comebacks in New Hampshire? That was even more absurd. This is a graph of pollster.com of every national poll that was taken in the Democratic primary. Uh, Clinton is um, purple, Obama's orange. This right here is the beginning of 2007. Here's the beginning of 08, so the, the earliest primaries were right about there. So what in the world did Clinton come back from? She was way ahead the entire year before Iowa. She won a narrow victory by one delegate in a tiny state. Excuse me, she, she lost, she lost a, a narrow victory by one delegate, and then she won a narrow victory in, in another tiny state. Yeah, in other words, the Rangers lose on opening day, but have a huge comeback in the pennant race by winning their second game. <laughs> oh, and by the way, since delegates are what matter, she didn't actually win New Hampshire. Anyhow, I think we have a good sense that the, the media narratives can be somewhat arbitrary. So, where are we? The complexity of the presidential nomination system give the press tremendous leeway in spinning each outcome. Now this spin, in turn, affects subsequent outcomes. The losers of the early races, even if they're far from being mathematically eliminated, lose the ability to raise money. This then leads to worse media coverage. Uh, the, the early the, the, the citizens tend then to jump on the early winner's bandwagon, which leads to even worse coverage. It's a vicious cycle. And soon everyone else is dropped out. 
think back to uh, the Democrats' nine-way race in 2004. John Kerry won Iowa, and then he won New Hampshire. That was pretty much it. All right, now, as promised, let's bring in the Texas legislature. Remember this, right? Because the press has been declined, inclined to declare a winner so early in, in recent cycles, Texas, who votes a little later, had, had been rendered completely irrelevant in the process. So a large majority of state legislators of both parties supported moving our primary to the, 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 the first Tuesday in February, Super Tuesday, rather than the first Tuesday in March. So did they? I think you know what happens by now. The, the, the bill passed the state house overwhelmingly and seemed to be on its way to passage in the Senate. But a handful of county election officials strenuously objected to moving the primary for trivial technical reasons having to do with filing deadlines and, and some other stuff. Now, according to Texas's rules of the game, you only need one-third of the 31 senators to block any bill. So these county election officials lobbied and lobbied, and they managed to find 12 Republicans in the Senate to block the bill. And we ended up voting on March 4th instead of February 5th. Now, the last piece of the puzzle, how did that end up giving the nomination to Obama? Well, as I said before, the, the press tends to declare a winner very early in the primary cycle, and by all accounts, they were prepared to do so in 2008. But something unexpected happened. Both Clinton and Obama ended up winning nearly the same number of delegates on Super Tuesday. And thus, the media spin ended up being McCain rolls, but Dems draw. Yeah, McCain takes a, a big lead. Uh, takes the major states handily, but Dems in a dead heat, a split decision. And thus began the marathon that finally ended in June when Obama clinched enough delegates for the nomination. However, had Texas moved its primary to Super Tuesday, I argue that Clinton would have gained enough additional delegates that day to be declared the overall Super Tuesday winner by the press. Now, we can never know for sure, but here's why I believe it. For starters, she won the first step in the Texas two-step, the primary, and thus was declared the winner of the state. Now, Obama ended up winning more delegates, but we didn't know that yet. Now, had Clinton won Texas on Super Tuesday, even by the same narrow 5147 margin as on March 4th, I argue that adding another large state win would have given her the overall victory that day, according to the press. And we have every reason to believe that, that had Texas moved its primary up, Clinton's margin of victory would have been even bigger. The reason is simple. The more Obama campaigned in a state, the more people liked him. In fact, political analyst Nate Silver studied the first three months of primaries and calculated that for every day the two candidates campaigned within a state, Obama ended up gaining about a point on Clinton. It's easy to understand why. Everybody already knew her, so she didn't have as much to gain by campaigning. Plus, he's a captivating, persuasive speaker. Now, since only four states voted on March 4th, Obama was able to spend 10 days in Texas. By contrast, Super Tuesday has far too many states to enable that sort of campaigning, and adding Texas would have made it even worse. I think it's safe to say that Obama would not have spent any more time in Texas than he ended up spending in the most important Super Tuesday state, California, and he only went there twice. So, perhaps eight fewer visits to Texas, and if the analysis is correct, Clinton may have won Texas by perhaps eight more points. In fact, polls taken here before the two candidates showed up had her ahead by about that much. So based on the media's past behavior, I think it's almost certain they would have declared that a convincing win for Clinton, for Texas, and for Super Tuesday as a whole, thus shifting the narrative so heavily in Clinton's favor, like they did for McCain, that even Obama's innovative, amazingly well-run campaign would not have recovered. 
So that's why the rules of the game matter. Why the news media are a lot more powerful than, than many people think. And why a single action by 12 Texas Senate Republicans in the 2007 session enabled Barack Obama to be inaugurated as the 44th president. <laughs>